Welcome everyone to the Deep Dive, the podcast that skips small talk and goes straight for the concepts that shape our thinking and behavior. In this podcast, cold expertise is defenestrated as warm philosophy is enthroned in an attempt to explore the field in which we're all scientists looking for answers, living well. Hello world and welcome to a reverse episode of the Deep Dive podcast. Today it is hosted by me, Tesho Akindeli, and we have our special guest, Eyal Shay, on the podcast with us today. So how are you doing, Eyal? I'm doing great. Thanks, Tesho, for taking on the role of interviewer today. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for giving me this opportunity. I mean, we had a great conversation before, so it'll be cool to to get you on the other side of things because i know a, a lot of times when you're hosting you don't get the chance to maybe insert your opinions too much so hopefully today is a great day for you to drive the conversation and give people more of a, a taste of what's going on behind your mind um and then speaking of that what what is the topic for today's episode so the topic is something which i find uh fascinating and dedicated some time to thinking about and i'm going to frame it as good better best all right uh, <laughs> yeah the idea basically is um I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about how i how i came to think about it something that uh, struck me uh, as very interesting is that people often and i have and I have firsthand experience of this, when people are asked, well, is something that is good enough good? They are very likely to say no, at least in our culture. And actually, just two days ago, I finally got to watch uh, Free Solo, the documentary about Alex Hono do um, Free Solo with El Capitan, right? So climb the whole thing, which is close to 3,000 feet without a rope, so something crazy. Um, and he said that his father would tell him, good enough is not. That, that was like a boniker that kept repeating in it, through his childhood. And he thinks that has been driving him toward doing, taking on these bigger and bigger challenges and in a sense, never finding satisfaction because it's never good enough. Nothing is good enough. Um, yeah, so, so this is kind of what got me thinking about this thing, and I just found it interesting. It was an aha moment of why do people think that something that is good enough, not good, even though it's in the name? That, yeah, that's super interesting. Do you think that that's something that you're also you know, a part of, like you feel that way in your life in general, or is it something that you more observe with other people? Yeah, I think that growing up in this culture, you know, what, what, what I had in my mind before I dedicated time and devoted time to actually doing dialectic and thinking about concepts and forming my own um, explanations about the world, then it's, it's very likely that I just grew up with whatever uh, culture, cultural memes that, you know, in the culture that I was steeped in. And yeah, so I think I, I grew up with probably this notion, although I don't think these very words or this very thought um, kind of ever came up in conversation for me, but it's, it's very likely that this is how I viewed things uh, up, until, up until when I had a chance to, to rectify it with actually thinking about it. And I do think that it's, it's something that in a very real way is harming us the fact that we don't think that good enough is good do you guys have the term over there uh keeping up with the joneses yeah i mean so well um I, i'm so americanized that it's just clear <laughs> to me that i have this concept and i'm like yeah. i can't think about it as an, as an israeli on the outside um but yeah i mean obviously Israel is looking up to America as a culture uh, with a lot of things and capitalism and, and consumerism has definitely been part of, of culture here for, um, and even more so in, in the last couple of decades, I want to say. 
Yeah, because when you, so when you bring up that concept, like is good enough good, I think of like keeping up with the Joneses because I think it's probably so relative, like in every in every sense, whether it's like financially is good enough good or, you know, whether you're the free solo guy, it's all relative to what you see other people doing, I think. And so that probably plays a huge part into like what do, what does good enough even mean in any sense? It has to do with I'm imagining, you know, like who you're surrounded by and like what their standards are. And I feel like keeping up with the Joneses is kind of a good a good way to frame this, at least in my mind, that that kind of makes sense to me. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this this is exactly what happens. It's our um, we're resorting just automatically to to ranking things, and this feels like we're solving the problem of of what is good because if we uh, are operating with some sort of uh, a metric on a cultural scale that kind of would tell us how well we're doing, then it seems to solve the problem of not knowing what the good, what or what is good actually is, right? So the second best thing is to just make sure that on a societal level, you don't appear to be in the bottom. And the things that are easy to make apparent are things that are quantifiable or uh, tangible, so something like money in the bank or the size of your house, right? Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. So it's like all the the exterior things might be what we're striving to show is good enough, but I know a concept you talk a lot about is like living well. That doesn't necessarily mean like you're happy, satisfied, and living well, like even if you have a lot of those things that, that may show to the world that you have like better than average, you might still inside internally be like way below average. It'd be nice if we if we could all compete maybe on that level instead, like the interior interior like good enough level instead of the exterior. It might be might make for a happier world. Yeah, it's you know. So the the classic example for me is Michael Phelps. You know, twenty something. Whoever knows how many gold medals this guy has, but world record holder, beautiful wife, tons of money healthy kids, guy wants to kill himself at some point, right? Doing reckless things, basically just having a death wish, right? Guy is at the top of the pyramid from every tangible metric, every metric that we can look at and judge. And this is, this is exactly it. So if, if, uh, if people are busy looking, are, am I good enough, you know? Well, they look at Michael Phelps and say that this is this is the top of the pyramid, right? Along with some other like billionaires and famous people, and it turns out that this is not it, you know. And we we have to take it into account and be serious about recognizing that all of this stuff is 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 not what it what it means, and we have to understand what is what it truly means, uh, what the concept of the good truly is. Uh, rather than actually take the shortcut and play this game of, of comparison with, with other people. Yeah, that's so true. And it's like you said earlier, because it's hard to, to really define it on a deep level, people just take the shortcuts. But, it, you know, it's like eating, eating a cookie. Like it feels good in the moment, but then it's not long lasting. Uh, so do you have, like, have you thought about, well, what's a solution for this, whether in your personal life or you know, on a larger scale? Yeah, yeah, it's definitely something that I sought out to, to, to solve for myself. I, and I think it starts with understanding the concept of the good, um, which is counterintuitive. It's something that I'm, I'm working, when I'm doing dialectic, I'm working with people. The concept of the good is, is very, very central. It appears in many of Plato's dialogues, which I read and analyze. And it, it for some reason, it, it's almost so simple that it's that it's complex for us. Um, but if we look closely, we see that no thing is actually inherently good because good is a is a relationship. So anything is both good and bad at the same time for different things. Context matters, and um, good has to do then with arrangement and composition. So when I'm thinking of living well, I'm thinking about good composition 
uh, and good um, behavior every day that keeps mental health. Uh, it's as, as like a ball that's rolling and never, and never stopping, right? And doing what's good is doing what is good for your mental health. Um, but I think this is not a, a common view. And if it's not, I think honestly that, you know, and I was in the same position before starting to think about that, we're practically um, having no, we have no idea of, of what living well means. And that is exactly why we resort to this um, comparing kind of uh, method and, and habit, because then at least you have the, the good, better, best to look at. And it's like, well, I'm, I'm not really sure what good is, but uh, I see that everyone is playing this game. And in this game, I can understand the rules and see that this is better than that and so on. Uh, but like we just mentioned, says nothing about your actual well-being. Yeah, I guess it's easier to play like society's game than to invent your own game, basically. <laughs> and so like, is that what is that kind of how you're saying it is like, in, we all need to just figure out what our individual game is, instead of like playing the same game that was just put out here for the rest of us? Yeah, absolutely. We we inherit. Um, uh, yeah, it can be framed as a game. We we inherit a, a culture and cultural ideas. And uh, these could be uh, turned out, this could turn out not to be that great for us. And, and this is the, the case here. And to make it more specific about uh, the, the good enough, why the good enough is not good, I think it's also because we are blessed or cursed. To some people, it might be uh, called cursed when it's not just comparing yourself to others in the here and now where that you can look look around you and see, but we also have this gift of having imagination, right? And then one thing that happens, and I hope it won't get too technical here, but this is something that we go through when I do dialectic with people, is take a knife and ask yourself, what, what is a good knife, right? And it turns out that, again, no knife is inherently good. It depends on whether it's able to actually perform the action it was designed for. So a knife is good for cutting, in essence, the, the concept of a knife. And then a, a good knife, in effect, is, is actually one that performs the job. And we have this gift of imagination that allows us to think of more than one knife. In reality, we encounter more than one knife. And in the here and now, there will be a knife that is better than other knife, and there will be a knife that is best out of the three. Um, but we tend to do it in our own minds about our own life. It come up and conjure images of a different life that's not ours, that's not a reality, where we can imagine ourselves as we are, but with a bigger house, as we are, but with more money in the bank, as we are, but with less worries or something, you know? And this is something that is actually detrimental. And it stems from the fact that we don't really understand what living well means because we might actually be able to do that and not worry so much about the, the, the stuff, the additional stuff that we can imagine. Yeah, it, yeah, it is funny because a lot of times when you, you know, people might look at other people's lives or the imagination, like you were saying that, oh, man, if only I had a bigger house and you only see the upside of it without like understanding that there's good and bad with everything. Like you said, you know, like Biggie Small said <laughs> with more money, more problems, you know, so it's and it's true with anything like a bigger house and you have a bigger bill or you got to clean more or whatever it is. And a lot of times people might forget that when they do the see the superficial things. Um, so I guess, how would you, how would you describe to someone on, on figuring it out for themselves on a base layer? Have you thought of like a technique to do that or just step back and try to start from the foundation? How do I figure out what is a good life for me? Yeah. Well, I think first of all, yeah, I do do that with people when I do uh dialectic, which is a one-on-one, -on -one, um, type of conversation that is aimed at creating concepts that are true 
So, and, and it's all designed to put things into place conceptually so that then when we go through life, things are actually easier because our thoughts are clear and we don't have to bump into um, intangible walls that we don't see um, and we don't have logical inconsistencies in our thinking. So I do do that with people. And then I think that thinking about what a good life is, it's, well, it's, it makes sense to, to start with the universals because we are a lot more alike than we are different as people. And then obviously at the level of the individual, there's going to be, you know, a lot of, a lot of little customizable things that uh, to each his own in, in, in uh, certain aspects. But I think we can agree that for all of us, some, uh, lo some, some logical premises uh, still hold true for all of us. And um, so this is what I try uh, doing with people. But I think in the end, and I'm just going to give it away, even though in dialectic it might take a while and it's, it's a back and forth thing where the person who is actually fashioning the understanding should kind of answer the questions for themselves. But when it comes down to it, there is, um, in my mind, and I'm saying this humbly, uh, no other option than to say that mental health is living well, is, is having mental health and doing all the things that actually um, just make it sustainable. I think, yeah, I, th I feel like that's a great like base layer, you know, because you can add anything on top of, you know, a life, but if you don't have mental health set, it's, it's not going to be right. Like you were saying, Michael Phelps, or, I mean, there's countless examples of people who on the surface appear to have everything, but they say behind the scenes, they're struggling so much with anxiety or depression or whatever. And then at the same time, you know, we all know the person down the block who, who, who just has a very simple life, but seems super happy every day. You know, like maybe they just got the, the one thing right, but maybe just getting that base right, the mental health of it right, gets you to good enough, you know, and then everything is like cherry on top. <laughs> Do you think that that rings true to you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's probably even though that even though most of us dream of being millionaires and billionaires and all that, actually, if, if you don't have a, a conception of, of mental health and the fact that this is actually living well, is enjoying mental health, you're probably better off being average. Because if you've actually risen to, to what is considered to be the top materially, now you're alienated from a lot of people. Um, I, I know a guy who has about $300 million and it's weird. It's, it's even weird on the personal level between me and him because this amount of money is just mind boggling and it changes things. It changes uh, dynamics of relationships. Um, you know, for me personally, I would, all, all, I would almost be uh, shamed to have that much more than other people. Um, at the same time, yeah, you're, you're probably just, your experience of the world is going to get uh, so different from that of, of people around you, that you are going to, uh, to be living a strange life. And, you know, the, the circle of people who could be your friends, as in understanding you, is, is vastly um, reduced, right? Because there are only so many millionaires and billionaires around. Um, and even them, they might have a profile of people who, from the beginning, are so obsessive about getting money because... There are some mental health issues. And mental health, by the way, if it's, if it's not clear already, uh, is not that common, okay? I'm not talking about the glaring illnesses of people talking to themselves on the street and, 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 and all that, all the stuff that's on the um, uh, manual that psychiatrists consult. Uh, mental health is, is something that I think our, our culture is not characterized by. Um, so how would you define it then? Like, what, what is it if it's obviously like, that's the extreme example of someone who's mentally unhealthy, but how, like, what would you define mental health as? Yeah. Yeah. yeah great question. Um, I think that making the analogy to physical health is, is definitely helping us to understand it. It's um, um, 
also comparing it with beauty helps because beauty and fittingness of objects like like we said knife towards uh, cutting uh, a beautiful picture we can see that there is a good composition it's about the composition not about individual elements because change any of the elements and it could make the picture ugly um, and also looking at physical health you see that it's a process so it's not a thing it's not a still photo that's stuck in time uh, it's something that is actually sustainable in a sense whereby in a certain context it makes sense to release cortisol or adrenaline or any of these hormones in a different context, you get melatonin, which is a different hormone that controls your sleep and so on. Um, and this is the same with, with mental health. Now, I don't say that I know exactly, it's, it's not about exactly um, identifying the organs of the soul or something like that. I get that this could be a little bit hard, but one thing to consider is like, look at it the way ancient Greeks looked at it, where you have, uh, reason, emotion, and desire, for example. Call these the organs of the soul if you want. Um, add creativity, which is kind of a process in the soul. And see that everything flows well through time and keeps being that harmonious rather than having um, inner strife and, and factions going on, which is, for example, if somebody is living their whole life and they can't get the idea out of their head that they want more money, that is probably detracting from, from, their, um, from their way of life. So that's one problem with being in that mindset of good, better, good. Yeah, I think what you said right there that stuck out to me was clear mind, you know, because, for example, tying it back to physical health, like you said, a physically healthy body is one that just doesn't disturb you as you move through the world, right? Like you're able to just kind of f freely flow. You can stand up, sit down. If you need to run, you can do it. If you need to lift something, it just doesn't, it doesn't hold you back in any way. And maybe in, in the same way, like a healthy mind is, it's not necessarily like the strongest mind or the smartest mind, but it's one that's just like clear and ready to perform given what, whatever circumstance pops up. Yeah, I love it. Uh, you hit the nail right on the head there. It's um, being mentally healthy is very likely to sound boring to a lot of people, honestly, because uh, we're thrill seekers, we're pleasure seekers. It's also something that we inherit culturally is hedonism and looking for the next peak and the next high and um, riding the, the, the roller coaster. And a lot of people, if they can't get the high, well, they can actually get addicted to getting the lows, uh, which is part of the ride. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it's just as you say, it's actually, I think for me personally, the shift happened when I started uh, being able to, to look back in time, not forward and say, well, you know, this past few weeks, I haven't had any inner strife and that feels good, but in a very different way from being uh, euphoric or something like that yeah another thing that i kind of think about is we have we have a pretty good blueprint as people on how to get a healthy body you know like you can google it right now how do i get a six-pack or biceps or whatever and people have a plan set out for you you know <laughs> but and there's a hundred plans but if if you looked up like how do i get a clearer mind it's less it's i mean there is some information out there but i feel like it's not as concrete and and maybe also people sometimes discount it like the the idea of like meditation or something that i've been into recently is journaling um people just kind of look at that like oh it's a little bit wishy-washy i don't know if i if i really need to do that you know and mm -hmm. and maybe we need as a society to like take some of these things more seriously and like understand what is the blueprint to to go from just like uh, just to get your mind back to a clear mind the way you would with the body yeah, you know, this goes back to our past episode about education, which is where it, where it all begins, really. Uh, it shouldn't be that hard, okay? The, the only reason we're struggling is because, it, the only reason I'm struggling with it is because I came across dialectic and thinking about these things at 23, 24. And uh, we should have good educators who just naturally 
let us develop into the rational creatures that that we have the capacity to be probably when we're 10 okay i'm actually talking to my daughter who's three and a half now and i see a lot more rationality in her than i sometimes see with with other people so it's not just something that uh, in a lot of ways, I think that unfortunately we grow up stunted, and then yeah, of course it's it's hard to um, to bounce back from that. And now it's it, now it's hard. Now we need to these uh, these blueprints. Now we need the mindfulness practice. Now we need the now we need the new habits that are hard to form. Uh, it shouldn't be that hard, but since since it is for us because we haven't, and I'm talking generally because that's that's the general rule. We haven't been um raised in that in that environment then yeah i feel like there's a lot of emphasis on um being able to detach yourself for for a moment for better or for worse from things outside where they stop kind of bombarding you with a lot of information and hurting you and and that's a good thing to do like meditation is something that i would i'm not a meditator today uh i don't think it should be a lifelong practice necessarily. I think it could be that you learn a lesson and you take it with you. Um, but I think that what is missing for me in meditation is the fact that it's kind of going into yourself and being uh, an island in some sense, unperturbed maybe for the period you're meditating, but it. Uh, there is very little instruction about how to actually operate in any other time when you're not meditating. And just it, meditating is not actually instructing you how to operate in the world. And to do that, well, you need to understand the good. Maybe instead of meditation, a good framework would be like mindfulness, like just being very aware of like, okay, what is the situation that I'm in? You know, like you were talking about, just mental clutter or whatever, if people could, instead of getting bombarded by things, take a step back and just be very mindful of like, all right, I, you know, like, where am I right now? What, like, how am I feeling? What are the other people saying to me and stuff like that? Instead of like meditation, just being more like aware of the world instead of getting trapped in your own head. Like someone like Michael Phelps that you, you brought up earlier, maybe if, if he was able to just kind of be more mindful in the moment, it might've helped like, you know, well, what is the situation? Like, I'm here, I have a nice house, I have this and that. It might, it might help him bring, bring him back instead of being lost in the clutter of, of our minds and all the baggage that we've had just piled in there over time. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think it's a good step. I think it's a, I think it's a, it's a two-step thing because uh, you could talk about a, a, a retreat, which is uh, not surprisingly how some of these things are called, right? Retreats is when you go out and for 10 days or however long, you're going there to retreat into your own self to uh, maybe take a step back from, from the bombardment. So if I, if I were to give like a real life example for some people is they might have a, a tense relationship with somebody who, you know, every time they get to hang out with this person, it might end up that they are um, just being treated in a way that they didn't ask for, that they don't find is, is good for them, right? Well, to retreat is to be able to be mindful, as you say, about all these things and have, have the awareness of, of what's going on, uh, wrong and how to protect themselves and maybe retreat inside and somehow get to a place of equanimity in the face of this uh, assault on them because they didn't ask to be there. But there's also another thing in the next level is to be proactive, is to choose to engage with things and be aware of the relationships you're forming. And that would make you this person's therapist, although you didn't ask for it. You are now going not just to take it and, and just somehow be okay, but do something that is proactive for yourself hold it back in a way that is um, aimed at helping the other person if, if you can, but maybe you can't because that's up to them. But at least if you can't, then being proactive, actually doing something, not just sheltering from, uh, from whatever is going on outside. So I think meditation, mindfulness practice is a lot of times this sheltering 
Um, I'm going into a cocoon, so I, I stop getting hurt. But the next step is to get out there and, again, be mindful, be aware, but be aware in the sense of I am now, I have agency. I am out here choosing consciously what to engage with, uh, what to engage with and what uh, relationship to be in. Yeah, I like that. Okay, so if we kind of think of it as I'm think I'm for some reason thinking of this as building up a pyramid. So so I'm just going to stick with it like that in my mind. But like step zero or step one would be just clearing everything out, you know, and you said kids are kind of born like this. So ideally, you know, maybe we would find a way to just keep that from birth. But if if it's too late, and you've become an adult, maybe you do need to do something like a meditation retreat or a brain dump writing everything down. So step one, maybe you clear your mind. And then step two is you re-enter the world, being more proactive about the types of activities and people you engage with to like make sure that that's that those everything that's coming into your life is is good for your mental health and is good and is good. Like you're actively choosing. I want to talk to this person because this person is good for me. I want to play this sport or live in this city or work this job because this is good for me. A little bit more proactive like that. Yeah, absolutely. Again, and if we if we use the useful analogy of physical health, you know, it's it's you can protect yourself from injury all day long, um, but not doing anything is not great either, right? You want to get out there. You want to exert your body, so it actually uh, this keeps the health. And unfortunately, we're in a culture where mentally um, we are. Uh, pretty much in a, in a constant chase after those few hours a week where we can indulge ourselves in, in doing nothing pretty much a lot of the time. This is a lot of our culture is, is based on this, on going to the vacation and, you know, this vacation on a beach is, is the highest good for some people. And that is centered on the idea of, right, I finally don't owe anything to anyone. I'm not doing anything, but this is really just just reaching a point where yeah you're not maybe if you have a job you hate this feels like a great relief right because you're not doing that job but you know there's still there's yet another higher peak above it which is do something that you actually love and this is much much more conducive to well-being yeah and you know the like the weekend is never long enough or the vacation is never good enough if you're living in that way so it, it, it definitely is, I agree, so much helpful to, to just put yourself on a, on a path that's more enjoyable instead of like an unenjoyable path that gets you breaks here and there, you know, because at the end of the day, like if you spend your whole life working a job you don't like, but you get five vacations a year, like it might, it's, it's not a good life, you know, it might be a life wasted in some sense. It's much better to maybe make way less money or even work longer hours in something that you find much more fulfillment in. Yeah, and these are, you know, I don't, I don't pretend to be some sort of guru on this, and I understand that life circumstances matter so much, but um, I'm also coming with, with my baggage and my experience and the Twitter sphere that I inhabit, you know, and meet people on, and so clearly this is appealing more to, um, to some sector rather than, rather than another, but I do think that if you aim at doing something that you love, then you are going to be better able to actually make it uh, sustainable because this, the thing that you love and that you're passionate about is probably going to be something that has more value also, also in the market. I realize this may not be true, okay? It's, but um, I do think that um, any person who is has enough interest, probably there is some intersection of these interests that really makes this person unique and very capable to do something that is that literally no other person can do. And that something is probably going to be found as valuable by at least some portion of the population. And today when there are, you know, several billion English speakers, you can probably have a large pool of potential um, consumers of, of what you have to offer so i think i think um i think it just makes sense to kind of look for the thing that you actually love doing yeah and it, it's possible like for some people maybe the thing you love doing 
results in like a billion dollar industry but it's also possible that it results in like enough money to get by which is also okay you know like if you're doing something that you're very passionate about and it results like and it results in a lifestyle that's very sustainable for you that seems like a win at the end of the day you know instead of instead of doing something you're not passionate about but like getting all the external things that don't that don't really matter or lead to a good life yeah well again if you have mental health you're you're set if you understand what it is if you understand what it is for you in your life and what it depends on then you can keep going okay there's and there's and there's nothing unhealthy about worrying about money okay it's a it's a legitimate worry it's a legitimate worry to um to worry about potential loss of loved ones any sort of like really bad thought is only bad as long as it's pathologized right and it's it, and it's a thought that kind of haunts us all around the clock right then then it's a problem uh, it's also a problem if if somebody's uh, uh you know self love is great right but thinking all day about how great you are that's narcissism right so anything that is kind of blown out of proportion and takes up more headspace than it really should over the course of the day uh that's a pathology but no one thought is is bad and if you get to a point where yeah i worry about stuff there are problems in life but part of mental health is to address the problems that most need solving and be uh be skilled at at doing that then you have every chance to keep your mental health and therefore live well where do you think something like goal setting comes into this or does it does it come into it at all do you does making like explicit goals help with like the proactive way you enter the world or is that in your opinion like maybe not so necessary yeah that's yeah that's a fascinating topic for me personally because i'm i'm not one of the people who's who's ever had a even a notion of what it's like to set goals like i have no idea why how people can actually choose a number and then do that this is just me personally right there's not saying that there's a, a right or wrong here but i've never been able to be one of the people who can visualize very strongly a goal that they want to be in like have the ferrari or have that position at work or um or anything like that uh but one thing i will say is that for me personally because i understand mental health to be a process it's it's not a static thing then saying saying thinking about a goal is is tricky because it the the assumption is that there is some sort of peak and then what right um mm-hmm. so i think that for uh, athletes right that are very very um are very much in the in the culture of like good better best right this can be a serious uh a struggle right to actually to actually get to to the end of the line and see oh well uh, i've won that medal now what and again phelps as we can see yeah that's that's a that's a treadmill you know and you might be feeling like oh i reached the stop and and uh yeah the wheel is just going to come back down again so for me personally goals are are weird sometimes i'm jealous of people uh who are able to to do that they seem to to progress using goals for me personally just something that i i never found easy to do instead of goals then could there be some sort of clear markers or like check boxes to to just go back and be like okay is my mental health still good you know like for i think a good way to keep doing this is keep tying it to physical to like your healthy body so you know you might know you how tall you are and you just weigh yourself every so often and be like okay like i you know you know i i'm doing good on on my physical health because my weight is okay and you say i don't have any aches and pains when i sit down so i'm doing good on my physical health you might have these little checklists that you go through whether you know um explicitly or implicitly just kind of in the back of your mind is there something similar with mental health that we can kind of say like how can we check in to make sure that we're still on a good track yeah that's a good question i mean i i think on one level it's very simple on but on the level of of real life it it gets complex because it's simple conceptually just 
just be with yourself. Know, know yourself, know how you feel, you know. Uh, look, and, and I, I mentioned before, like for me, it's go back a week, go back two weeks in time, go back two months. Well, what, what did it feel like? Did it feel like there was some inner struggle there? Was I actually talking with people and expressing a lot of um, difficulties about, about stuff, like life isn't as it should be, and I'm, I'm struggling against myself, like I have these voices, one voice says one thing, the other says another. Uh, I think this is a sign that not everything is in its right place, and that's a way to kind of take the temperature. Um, so conceptually, it's it's easy, but of course we know that it's not that easy to actually be in touch with yourself uh, in an, in a way that's immediate and not mediated by cultural means. So some people just get um, so far gone so that they do not trust themselves in, in the least and all they can judge their own well-being by is looking at the good, good, better, best mentality and seeing that, you know, well, no, I don't have the bigger house, so I'm not doing well. No, I'm not. I'm, my friend just got this promotion instead of me. And so, no, I'm not doing well. Uh, so I think that is, that is, but that is the problem, is how do we actually learn to trust ourselves uh, once again, where we can speak with ourselves in a manner that comes across as trustworthy and honest with ourselves. A lot of people seem to, to lack that, and that's a shame. Yeah, what I, what I was thinking about during that is just journaling which I kind of brought up earlier. I think that that's because you say go back two weeks. I don't know about you, but <laughs> without journaling, I have a very hard time remembering how I felt or what I did two weeks ago. You know, So I think if people can maybe journal and be really honest with themselves, you know, hopefully like you can, I think it helps to have a journal that's very private. Like, you know, no one else is going to look at it and you can just be honest and say, if you're feeling up or down or embarrassed or say anything like be really honest i think that's a good way to keep maybe checking in and what i do is you know i journal i try, try to journal every day and then i go back at the end of every week and kind of review the week and i always find it so insightful on how i felt even you know a few days ago and uh, it i don't know it's been it's been helpful for me and so i could imagine that being a good a good way for people to like monitor their own mental health in in that way and their progress yeah. too towards you know good better best like what were you thinking two weeks ago oh did you achieve that like you did you know feel good about yourself yeah I, I I know a lot of people like you that that love journaling I'm the polar opposite just about it's just from a young age I do not like uh, to write by hand uh, for different reasons uh, probably because when I was dying like I went for um, to get diagnosed when I had trouble in school, like keeping up with the handwriting and said, now it's not your, that your hand is, is slow or that you're um, dysgraphic or whatever. It's just that your mind is way too fast. So I, I always had trouble catching up. And, um, and so it, it kind of made me hate it. Um, so I, I don't journal myself, but I know a lot of people who haven't, like you say, yeah, that's, that's a, that's a, a great way of doing it. Um, and and it's it's very different conceptually. So it's actually very hard for me to get in the mind of, of somebody who journals because I operate very differently and I just look at things very uh, big picture and just have the notion of just like, what are some salient memories from, from these two weeks for me that do stick despite the fact that I don't journal? You know, and if, if I find that the, that the salient memories are of me and my daughter having this amazing conversation about death recently, for example, which for some weird reason was like highly enjoyable. Um, you know, if I have a, a sort of mental vignette of us being on some swing in the playground or doing something like that, then everything must be good, right? I mean, if no other bigger, better thing comes to mind, well, this, this is good. Life is good, apparently. Yeah, I like that. Just so just kind of just trying to think back and just loosely looking for the big, you know, boulders or big events that kind of stick out to you 
is a good way to check up because that that's what I was thinking when you said look back two weeks is how do you remember two weeks but maybe you don't need to remember all two weeks you know like surely you remember something from the last two weeks so like what is that thing I I, I really like that way of framing it yeah it's um it, it's very interesting I mean it's who, who said that we again it's it's part of the culture of of chasing the peak chasing the the peak experience of you know, I want to look. I want to look back two weeks and on every day see a highlight or something. Who said life is about that? You know, if I go back two months and all I can remember are like beautiful moments with my daughter, it's a much more subtle way of uh, perceiving fittingness in life. And it's. Um, I think that uh, I I did say this on the podcast before, but to me, like the whole the little uh, visual that I have in my mind about my life and how I try to have experiences that are good is not so much fireworks, but more like uh, something that just uh, drips pure water into a, a jug that just fills. And this jug is kind of my feeling of, of well-being and happiness. And it, it evaporates, okay? So naturally, there's evaporation. And we need to fill it all the time. But as long as I fill it with this pure water and just very gentle, uh, with very gentle drops, just kind of falling in and dribbling in there, something very pure, you know, the opposite of fireworks and all that. And I think just over time, this is what is going to matter to you when you go back and you get to the point where you're looking at decades back. Okay, we're still young people, but... Going back, I think what you want to see is that type of very mellow um, and consistent, um, yeah, cycle, cycle of just just being well. Yeah, that reminds me a lot of this concept from like Buddhism, the middle way, which is, and you know, the way that I heard it kind of described is there's a pendulum that it, like if a pendulum is swinging, it takes a lot of energy and it's constantly swinging back and forth from the fireworks, like you said, to the despair of depression, you know, in, in a lot of people's minds. But if you can just find that middle way, which is kind of how I see those drops, like it's just, it's consistent. You can stay there, you know, like you can stay in balance, no effort needed and just kind of like smoothly move through, move through life. I, and I, I really like uh, that. That's kind of how I try to think about it a lot too. And I try to, I kind of pride myself on staying very, mellow but in a a positive way you know like just enjoying things for what they are like taking things as they come and rolling with it smoothly instead of getting caught too much in the highs and lows yeah i know i asked you just before we recorded this like being in a a sports player and all if you're if you're highly affected by by results and you said that uh, less so than than other people and it's yeah, I'm interested in in that experience. Are you are you uh, are you standing out in that regard? Mm, I don't know. I think that everybody deals with it their own ways, the same ways that in in normal life people deal with you know their promotions or their their everyday struggles in different ways. So I think it's more of a personality thing that's that's general than it is specific to sports. I would say. Yeah, I'm wondering because you know we have this perception that. Basically, the players out there on the field are going to determine uh, a major part of the fans' emotional life, right? Who are who are watching and are so engrossed in this roller coaster of a of a soccer season. In your case, and I, I'm just wondering about all the times where we hear about athletes that are reacting inappropriately to losses, like they go out partying, and then obviously it's like not fitting. Um, but I'm wondering if there is some sort of expectation almost to um, to show emotions, you know, just being out there and, and being seen. Um, yeah, just it's just a thought that crossed my mind. Yeah, I think that there is sometimes like an expectation to like really just relish in the goals. Like people love a good goal celebration, you know, or to like really be down and distraught when when you lose. Sometimes there is that expectation, but... You know, everybody has to deal with it their own way. And I think you have to be, you have to, you kind of have to lean into what's right to you. And I guess like similarly, you know, in, in your own life, your your family 
almost in some sense are like the fans of your life, you know, like whoever you are, your family or your friends, like they're the ones kind of watching your life. And um, so, <laughs> you know, you don't want to get caught too much in the ups and downs for your own family. Like, and if something goes wrong and you start behaving badly, like it affects your family, you, you don't want to, you don't want to act like that in sports. You don't want to act like that. You don't want to act like that in normal life too, because you always have people depending on you to, to come and, you know, get a job done and like be, be the best version of yourself. Right. I mean, this is, this is so important to remember that um, we do need to keep in mind that certain activities are not, are, are kind of an ex territory where we, where we foray into, but then we come back from and yeah, if if your work is very emotional, then maybe not not bring it at home. And remember that this is what what you're doing. Remember that the that the best thing you can do. And in sports, it's it's very accentuated. But really, in any field, I think the 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 highest the the highest peaks we conquer is when there is teamwork and there is connection and there is uh, working towards a certain goal. And I think that is what uh, sports brings us and why it's such a powerful metaphor for life that can bring a lot of good because it can actually make it easy for us to perceive that the good has to do with fittingness. Um, and in sports, it's very accentuated, also the confusion where um, you might lose it and think, and think that it's all about winning, like actual winning, being, being a victor over somebody else, right? When I think that's not the, the best thing that we could take away from sports, the best thing we could take away is seeing people exert themselves, being proactive, um, not selfish, towards a, a, a goal greater than themselves. Like these are all the good things we can take from sport. The winning is actually where the metaphor breaks down because life, it's again unclear. As soon as we think there is something that's called winning in life well let's say you've made your exit as a as a high-tech startup founder and that's like you're winning and you're 36 uh, it's like shit <laughs> well it's all downhill from here i guess you know yeah so you said like <clears throat> the the main metaphor to take is to be proactive and like exerting yourself and then i guess that's what people need to see is like where where in society can you fit in that you can be proactive and exert yourself in a healthy way that's sustainable you know instead of just saying i need to chase like you know the better than average and this or that just say like where where do i fit in that i can i can really challenge myself and like bring myself 100 percent to this job or whether it's to parenting or your your relationships like because like you said in sports it's very clear like you're part of the team you're part of the fan group and in life, you know, we're part of just the human race, you know, like we're part of society. So like, how can you like be a part of society and like push the whole group forward um, instead of just being on your own individual journey versus like one other person, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, it's, 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 it's a great thing to, to ponder on. I think that, you know, the recently I saw something about what is the work-life balance uh, or good work-life balance. And I'm like, well, the best thing is to understand that this is a fallacy because you work while you live, but um, it's it's not something that, that goes uh, vice versa. So uh, you, at no point you, you work and not live. It's like, so what does it mean to balance it? You know, but we're just in a culture that where you do go to do the work, which is traditionally not necessarily your um, your passion project. And then, and then over there, or it's even being part of a country or part of a company. What, what are they trying to do? They're trying to get you hyped up about being part of this team, right? As if this is life. So do your thing as a team. Well, it turns out that usually in companies, capitalistic companies and, and, and nations, turns out that we're very prone to being exploited by people who instill in us a sense that we're part of a team um, and it's very interesting because in that context, they make us exert ourselves and connect with other people 
And this is very powerful and good for mental health, but it's not the end all be all of mental health. The, because being mentally healthy is actually being able to do that outside the context of belonging to a nation, to a sports team, to a company, to a, an army, right? So in the army, you know, people who spend time together in foxholes are going to be brothers in arms. And this is, this is very powerful. I know this from my dad um, who's fought wars but then there's the, the other life. And then again, it goes into this idea of you have the week, you have the five days where you're part of that, and then you're thrown into the weekend where kind of you're out of that. And this is where you indulge in kind of, you're almost out of any identity or something. So maybe you have the identity as a parent or that, but in any case, the, the, the attitude should be for us to explore how everything could be made as whole as possible one thing rather than having on your schedule like family time, friends time, work time, leisure time, me time. These are all different times when there's really just one time and it's all the time it's you needing to be aware of what needs to be done next to keep your mental health, right? So it shouldn't be compartmentalized eventually. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And <clears throat> I think we keep coming back to the idea of like making sure that you're the one deciding like what is your, your good life instead of letting someone else decide it for you. So like instead of when you say good, better, best and you're competing with the people around you, like you're letting them decide what's good, better and best or whether maybe you're in a, in a company or, in an, or a country where it's like rah 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 but then you're letting them decide what the goal is and like what your role is in that situation instead we need to do a better job of deciding for ourselves like and maybe for some people like the best thing is to to get a car and that's like really going to make you happy or the best thing is to like be a, the best member of this company and push it and then that's great for you you know but make sure that you're proactively choosing that instead of getting swept into that and then maybe you're less likely to worry about work-life balance because maybe working 12 hours a day is great for you because you absolutely love it and it just like keeps you going or, or maybe not, you know, but like make sure that you can, you, can, you can find that and then you won't have the big swings of maybe being upset during the week and then you, you just go crazy on the weekends and you're just constantly going back and forth between the two and you can just be sustainable about it. Yeah, absolutely. Having having your own strong idea about what is good for you, being a scientist in the sense that, yeah, I'm going to experiment. I think this is going to be good for me. Let me run this experiment, see what the results are, and judging them maybe with the, with the ways we spoke about before. Well, did that feel good internally? Was I fighting myself within myself or not? And yeah, not ever feeling the dissonance of achieving some goal and noticing that, yeah, well, actually, this doesn't feel good at all. And I need some sort of self-medication here. Um, not feeling that you've been duped by the head of your company, which, you know, in the end, it turns out that you exerted yourself so much. And then there's actually nobody there to recognize what you did. And you operated with the belief that you're part of a, of a nation, of a team that's, that's out here creating something worthwhile. And in the end, it just kind of fizzles into nothingness and nobody's there to actually, who knows your name and recognizes uh, what you've done. I think this is a common feeling for a lot of people that can be burning out, you know, where you're just, the people you work for are not grateful. This is not true in the context of how we evolved as part of, of, of a tribe where everybody knows everybody. Yeah. So do, do you think then that we should, speaking of the tribe thing, like try to create smaller communities then like, and just be more proactive maybe inside of like tighter knit, smaller communities than just getting sucked into like bigger groups or bigger companies that might be a way to help with the, you know, the mental health and the living well thing. Yeah, right. I think that um, we all definitely need different circles around us. I do think that it's it's even the fact that, that you and I can, can connect now and maybe possibly in the future be that part of that circle for one another. It speaks um, for globalism and the fact that we have created 
nations, but there's constant evolution, you know? So I'm not downplaying the role of any sort of advancement, social or technological, that has happened because it's it's brought us where we are now. But yeah, definitely, again, we should be proactive and look forward and see what what is good for us now and be thankful that we have the technology to to connect. I think that in the past, the contribution of, let's say, something like organized religion, the contribution that it made toward where we are today is undeniable. And, and the fact that, um, and only at, at that point, going back in time when tribes, you know, it was basically about ethnicity and, and race and resources, like you were just not going to take the time to find out if this other tribe who you don't even understand the language of is going to be your friend or foe, if there, if there are limited resources, you're going to go to war. Well, in that sense, if you have religion and you have some sort of shared belief that now makes you less aggressive towards that tribe and is down the road, uh, enables cooperation, in that sense, uh, religion was beneficial. It brought us to, to where we are, okay? Today, we look at, at, at phenomena like uh, radical anything, and we say, oh, that's terrible, and it is. So maybe it's time to move on, you know, because, because we know better we need a, 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 a more progressive uh, shared belief. Um, so do we need to... Do we need to cl- be closed again in small communities? Uh, no, but I think that I see a lot of uh, a lot of really good progress being made in the, in the online sphere of people connecting, and then even making great efforts. Like next week, I'm going to be in Austria with four or five people that I met online, you know, and just be hanging out and making art, hopefully. And this is hugely exciting, and I think that's the future: just being able to meet more people that are of your kin. Uh, spiritually um, or whatever and and stick to them so I think we're in an age where it's more possible than ever before yeah so maybe you know we do as humans there's only so many people you can interact with but now you're not tied just to your location you know you're tied you can really 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 be proactive proactive about who are those people, you know, like me and you connected, we have a lot of common, even though we live all the way across the world from each other, like we kind of proactively joined interintellect, and then we're able to connect with each other and a call and now we're here, you know, so um, the internet can be used as a tool for proactivity in kind of creating the life that that you want and a life that is a good life for you. Yeah, absolutely. And you see this with, um, you know, DAOs in Web3, just being able to form mini governments and uh, people to coordinate together and achieve goals that before then were reserved for governments or official organizations. Today, people can coordinate with one another, create a group that does not wait for the government to fix the, the county road, you know, that, that is broken or something like that. Maybe they can raise money and and do that on their own. And that is going to be way more efficient in some sense because it's going to um, address problems that really need solving um, as far as the the people consider it. Yeah. Well, I think, I mean, in general, I feel like we we covered a lot. And I honestly, I think we took away some really good action items for people. And just to, I guess, recap is like mental health is the base, you know, so like, and, and we kind of said a clear mind is a good mind. That's, that's kind of where you need to start. So just make sure to declutter your mind and, and whatever that takes, whether it takes the extreme version of going on a retreat or journaling, talking to somebody, whatever. I think like that's a good place for people to start in their own journey for a good life. And then the second step is just to proactively then add things in to that clear mind, that healthy mind that that keep your mental health intact and you know, are are moving you towards your vision of a good life. Yeah, absolutely. And to tie it back with the theme of the episode, I just, I will explicitly say that, you know, finding out what living well is, what the good is, 
can help us uh, get out of the loop of the good, better, best, which can be detrimental to our mental health because we don't just look inside. Anytime I said that I can look back a few weeks back and see that things were good, well, they were also good enough. And the good enough is, <laughs> is good, as the name suggests. And it's only us with our habit of actually being able to imagine something better that we say that the good enough is not good. But guess what? That better thing, it's imaginary. And that is something, something to keep in mind. And that when it comes to life, we want to have them. We want to live a good life. We don't want to live the best life because actually we could all be mentally healthy at the same time. And I will never be stepping on your toes in order to get my mental health. It's just unnecessary. Uh, if people tread on one another's toes, it's always to, um, to beat them to, because of a menta mentality of scarcity and competition. And that's just not part of, of life. I love that. Just like the mentality of abundance, we can all live a good life. You know, we can all achieve what we need to achieve in this world. And you don't, you know, you don't need to step on anybody's toes to, to make that happen. That's amazing. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for letting me do this. I was nervous, but so hopefully it came out all right. Hopefully we covered the topic well. Uh, and hopefully, you know, the listeners got some value from this podcast. I, I took away a ton of value, so I hope other people did as well. Yeah, thanks, Tesho. Thanks for uh, for taking the opportunity and doing this. I really appreciate it. And it's always fun to to connect with you. And uh, the same the same is just what you said. I just hope that uh, people enjoyed it. And um, yeah, the next time. All right. So we'll see you guys later uh, in the next week, guys. Episode.